join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a man called Peter, who is calling about a used car, and a woman called Tina, who is selling the car. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, it's Peter speaking. I'm calling about the ad you put online for a used car. Sorry, what was your name again? Oh, sorry, it's Peter Smith. Oh, hi, I'm Tina. Good to hear from you. So tell me, which car are you after? I'm interested in the sedan, the 2012 Toyota sedan. We have a few of those available right now. Let's see. Was it the Black Pearl one? Or maybe the Barcelona red one? Oh yes, I saw the red one. But I don't really like red cars. The one I'm after is silver. Right, I see. OK. Well, what would you like to know? Well, it says in the ad that it's in good condition. What does that mean exactly? Well, the paint is original. There are almost no scratches or dents. It looks like a new car, in fact. There was a tiny scratch on the door, but we polished that right out for you. Oh, that's good. How's the engine? The engine? Ah, oh, yes. Well, there haven't been any problems, and it's been serviced regularly. You know, oil changes, lubes, and so on. The previous owner was a very careful old lady, and she looked after it. It's only had the one driver. Oh, except that on the papers it says two owners because her son took over the ownership when the old lady stopped driving. How about the tyres? Are they in good condition? I do a lot of driving on the open road. Well, they all passed the car safety test. You might need to replace the back ones in the next six months or so because they're a bit worn. But the owner had the front two replaced only a couple of months ago. So those ones are new. You won't need to replace them for ages. Oh, and it had new brake linings recently too. I have the garage receipts for all of those things. OK, that's good. And what extras does it have? Well, air conditioning, of course. And there's a nice stereo which plays CDs. Or you can use it with an MP3 player. Mm, what else? All the usuals, power steering, central locking, ABS brakes. Oh, and it also has a tow bar. You can remove that and store it inside the car when you're not using it. Um, what else? You know it's manual transmission, right? Yes, I don't want an automatic. And the tow bar sounds great. I need that for carrying my bike. OK, well, that all sounds very cool. And you're asking $25,000, is that right? No, no way. <laughs> I think you must have the wrong ad. This one is 30000 and we won't go lower than that. Hmm, I see. What's the mileage again? Most cars of that age would be around 80,000 kilometres, or even up to 120,000. But as I said, the old lady didn't drive much, so it's very low. Only 50,000. You won't get a better low mileage car than this one. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen 
and answer questions 8 to 10. OK, well, I'd like to come and see it if that's all right. Where do you live? I'm in the suburb of Pembrose. Do you know where that is? Sorry, can you say that again? I'll just check on my GPS. Yes, I'm in Pembrose at 352 Hunter Place. H-U-N-T-E-R. Oh yes, I see, yes, that's OK. It's about 30 minutes drive from here. No, that's no problem. So, when would you like to come? How about this evening? I could come at 5pm. Oh, no, sorry, I forgot about my gym class. How about 6.30? Does that suit you? Look, sorry, I have someone else coming then. Can you make it a bit later? Say, 7.30? Well, OK then. But that's getting a bit late really, and it'll be dark by then, won't it? I'd really like to see the car in daylight if that's OK. Well then, how about 4-ish? Yes, that's good. OK, let's say 4.30pm. And I guess I'll just have to be late for the gym. I'm usually very punctual, so being late just once won't matter too much. Yes, fine. See you then. Oh, just in case there's a problem, what's your mobile number? Oh, of course. It's 09-367-8192. Um, ignore that. It's my landline. Of course, it makes more sense to give you my mobile. That's 045-352-7652. Got that? Excellent. See you later, Peter. Yes, sure. Bye, Tina. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a tutor talking to a group of philosophy students. First, look at questions 11 to 13. For these questions, complete the blank spaces in the table as you listen to the first part of the talk. Write no more than two words for each answer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. Russell, and I am your tutor for philosophy this year. I think we're all here. Let's see. Five, six, seven. Yes, that's everyone. Before we look at the three lectures you've had on philosophy this week, I would just like to run through a few things about what you can expect of me as tutor and what in turn we expect of you. As for myself, my function as tutor is to help you in all things relating to your work in the philosophy course. The help that I am able to give is of course mainly academic. For personal matters, I can refer you to other support services in the university, ranging from counselling to um, welfare. One thing that I would point out is that if you feel that you need to talk to someone, no matter how insignificant it is, don't leave it. Oh, and the last thing is, if you do need to make an appointment, the times are listed on the door of my room. You just write your name in a time slot. Uh, but I would point out that the appointment slots get booked up quite quickly. If it's urgent, catching me between sessions is the best idea. That way we can sort something out quickly. Um, no questions? Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20.
As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. For questions 14 to 19, circle the correct letter A, B, or C. For question 20, write no more than three words for the answer. OK. As regards you as students, the tutorials are voluntary. You're not obliged to attend, but you are encouraged to do so. Last year, for the first time, a register was kept of students attending lectures, and this year tutors are being asked to keep a register of tutorial attendance. This is not a formal register, and not all tutors will be doing it, but in the philosophy department all of us have chosen to keep registers. Another point that's being emphasised this year is punctuality. When we did exit questionnaires, we found that people arriving late for tutorials and lectures was the single most annoying thing for the majority of students. Mm. I would therefore ask you to try to be on time for the tutorials, mm. and for all your other classes for that matter. Mm -hmm. As regards the tutorials themselves, we will have a review of the philosophy lectures of the week before, with the discussion being led by one of you each week. There is, of course, some planning involved, but you should rely primarily on the notes you made at the lectures. This will not take up the whole of the 90 minutes allocated to the tutorial. For the rest of the time, we will look at a particular philosopher, period or concept for which you will be expected to do some preparation each week. This will range from reading about a particular individual or concept to preparing a brief outline on a subject of your choice. How much you put into this depends on you, but we're not expecting in-depth analysis at this stage. Um, are there any questions so far? I'd just like to ask whether the work we do in the tutorials counts towards our continuous assessment, and if so, how much? I was just coming on to that point. All the work you do in the way of essays and project work that is graded counts towards your continuous assessment grades. The mini-presentations and lecture discussions will not be graded, but obviously, as time goes on, these activities will, I hope, have an impact on your work, and hence your scores. Does that answer your question? Basically, yes. But what about... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the best ways to study. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, how are you both settling in? Fine. Yes, no problems. So far, anyway. Good. Remember that as your personal tutor, I'm here to help you if you do have any difficulties. Now, as you know, lectures start on Monday, so I thought we'd look at a few ways of making the most of them, especially in terms of the notes you take. Let's begin by thinking about what you can do before you even go to the lecture. Any ideas? Um, make sure you're up to date with all the background reading, so you know plenty about the subject already. Yes, that's essential. The lecturer will assume you have that knowledge. Anything else, Carlos? Well, uh, 
check what the topic's going to be. Of the lecture, that is. I'd go a bit further than that and consider what the content may be. Then you could ask yourself some questions that you want answering and listen out for the relevant information during the lecture. OK. Now that brings us to the lecture itself and the actual business of writing notes. But there is a lot to deal with there, so we'll come back to that later. What I'd like to do for the moment is continue with the process of note-taking and move on to the next stage. Any suggestions for what that might be? When the lecture is over, you mean? Yes, once you're able to sit down somewhere quiet with your notes. Uh, read them? More than that, you need to make sure they'll still make sense to you weeks, months later. Edit them? Yes, that's what's needed. Mm. It's well worth spending a few minutes on it. Any missing words, anything difficult to read, things you didn't have time to jot down, now is the time to do so, while everything's still fresh in your mind. Right. And after that, when's the best time to revise them? When do you think, Carlos? Um, I'd say just before the next lecture, in the same subject. Precisely. <laughs> That's a vital time to look at them again, for obvious reasons. But it's definitely not the only time. When should you revise them again? A month later, maybe? Uh, sooner, and much more often than that. I'd recommend you look at them again once a week. That's why it's so important they're complete and easy to follow. Before the talk continues, look at questions. Now answer questions 26 to 29. Right. Let's go back to note-taking and begin with the basics before the lecture has even started. What should you do when you walk into the room? Get a good seat, at the front if you can, uh, where you can hear clearly and avoid distractions. Yes, though obviously others will have had the same idea, so it's as well to get there a bit early. So, when the lecture's underway and you're busy jotting things down, what should you try to ensure? That you're getting all the main points. And what if you don't catch something, something you know must be important? Um, uh, I'd leave a space. Then I could check it later, perhaps by asking a question at the end and fill it in afterwards. That's an excellent way to deal with it, yes. <laughs> and there's something else I'd like to mention here. Talking about going through notes afterwards, it's absolutely vital that what you write is legible for one very good reason. It saves time. You'll waste many hours during the course if your revision is held up because you can't read what you've written. OK, what else can we do to make listening and note-taking more efficient? Well, I always listen out for signpost words. Uh, uh sorry. What are they? <laughs> they're the ones lecturers use to say where they're going. A bit like a signpost at a road junction, I suppose. Things like, the first reason is, however, to sum up, and so on. Yes. They can tell you when something important is coming, and help you organise your notes, too. Now answer question 30. Is there anything else you can add, Carlos? Uh, there's something I think's very useful, but it's later, after the lecture is finished. Yeah, that's fine. Go on. Well, what I do is go through what I've written down, summing up the main points in a few words in the margin, on the left-hand side of the page. I try to use words that'll jog my memory, so that I can remember what everything's about when I look at them again. Yes, that can work very well. What some people do to review their notes is cover up their full notes from the lecture, maybe with a piece of paper or a card, and concentrate just on what they've put in the margin, trying to recall the details. Then they move the cover down a little and check whether they were right. 
Or you could put your main points on another piece of paper and clip them together. Instead of covering and uncovering, you just hold a page in each hand. Sure. It's down to personal preference, really. Everyone has their own learning style. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a professor give a lecture on Louisa May Alcott. First, you have some time to look at the questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and complete the timeline in questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Today I'd like to continue our discussion of the lives of prominent American writers by talking about Louisa May Alcott, one of the best-known 19th century writers. Alcott is known for her moralistic girls' novels, but she was a much more serious individual than those novels might lead one to believe. She was born in 1832, the daughter of Bronson Alcott, who was one of the founders of the Transcendentalist movement. Bronson Alcott was a philosopher, but not a provider, and the family lived close to poverty. From an early age, Louisa was determined to find a way to improve her family's economic situation. As a teenager, she worked to support her family by taking on a variety of low-paying jobs, including teacher, seamstress, and household servant. Alcott also started writing when she was young. She wrote her first novel when she was just 17 years old, although it wasn't published until many years after her death. It was called The Inheritance. In 1861, the Civil War broke out. Alcott worked as a volunteer, sewing uniforms and bandages for soldiers. The following year, she enlisted as an army nurse. She spent the war years in Washington, nursing wounded soldiers at a military hospital. While working at the hospital, she wrote many letters to her family at home in Massachusetts. After the war, she turned the letters into a book, which was published under the title Hospital Sketches. She also wrote numerous romantic stories, which she sold to magazines. Around this same time, she was offered the opportunity to travel to Europe as the companion to an invalid. When she returned home from Europe in 1866, she found her family still in financial difficulty and in need of money. So she went back to writing. Her big break came in 1868, with the publication of her first novel for girls, Little Women. The novel achieved instant success, and the public wanted more. From then on, Alcott supported herself and her family by writing novels for girls. It wasn't the writing she had dreamed of doing, but it earned her a good income. Alcott took care of her family for the rest of her life. In 1878, her youngest sister May got married. A year later, May died after giving birth to a daughter. Louisa Alcott raised her sister's orphaned child. In 1882, Bronson Alcott suffered a stroke. Soon after that, Louisa Alcott set up a house for him, her niece, her sister Anna, and Anna's two sons in Boston. Her mother was no longer living by this time. Alcott was still writing novels for girls, including two sequels to Little Women, Little Men and Joe's Boys. The latter was published in 1886. Louisa Alcott had suffered poor health ever since she contracted typhoid fever while working as a war nurse. She died in March of 1888, 
at the age of 55. She was buried in Concord, Massachusetts. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.